apologize to colleagues about taking off your bank holiday. When I booked this in with Matt earlier in the week, I completely forgot it was a bank holiday because uh, they've changed it. So it kind of shows how we're working at the moment. And I know my school's open today. Um, so, you know, it isn't really a bank holiday for teachers, despite the, uh, um, some of the, uh, the negative press we're getting. So uh, thank you for everybody for tuning in today. Uh, we've got 86 on the line at the moment, um, and we may get a few more joining in as Dan goes and monitors the uh, entrance room. So today's um, format is going to be um, Matt's going to speak, he's going to give us information that he's learned uh, about COVID so far. He's also a dad as well, which is really important, and he sends his, uh, his children to Ray's school. So is, is, Ray, is Ray Snape with us today? I am, I'm here. Welcome Ray, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, so Ray's over in Cambridge, he's at NLE over in Cambridge, um, working as a head teacher. And Ray, you're going to curate the questions, aren't you? Yeah, end. that's right. So they... The chat is open and uh, please put your questions there and we'll see what we can do at the end of the talk that Matt is going to start us with. Excellent. Okay. And we've also got um, my co-chair today is Dan Thomas and Dan Thomas is the uh, CEO of Learning for Life Partnership um, over in Cheshire East. Dan, are you there? Yeah. Morning, everybody. Um, thanks, to, thanks for joining us today. Um, we are recording this um, session today um, and we're, we're going to hopefully share this around because we've got uh, Matt uh, talking to us, but if you don't want your your video to be shared, if you you can turn your screens off. But by being online, we're we're, we're hoping that you all agree that you're okay that this is shared. Um, we are going to um, have about an hour this morning, we think. And um, if you could put all your questions in the chat, um, Simon might bring you in um, if you if there's a particular point you want wants raising. So just keep an eye on his screen um, and hope hope it goes well. Thanks, Dan. That's great. And um, okay, so I'm going to introduce Matt. Um, Matt, do you want to say hello and just tell us a little bit about yourself, and then I'll I'll start you off um, with some topics that we can we'd like to hear about. Yeah. So um, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Matt Butler. I'm a consultant um, physician and geriatrician at um, Adam Brooks Hospital. Um, back in uh, um, so it was early March time. We were asked to um, volunteer. Um, or whether or not we'd want to volunteer to do COVID work. Um, and I was one of eight consultants that volunteered to man um, what used to be our um, sort of isolation ward, but we rapidly turned it into um, our COVID assessment unit, which is effectively the, the red side or the dirty side of the emergency department to try and segregate um, COVID patients from non-COVID patients, because um, obviously with an infectious disease, what you want to try and do is to limit its um, spread an end to being a ward with um, exclusive side rooms and ensuite facilities was sort of ideally suited to that. So I've been doing that for pretty much the last um, six weeks. Um, uh, I've seen a lot of um, patients with um, COVID um, uh, ranging from ages from 16 right the way up to I think my oldest was 98, um, varying degrees of presentation. So I've seen all the um, sort of the nuances of the, um, of the disease. Um, I'm not a paediatrician, so I haven't seen um, COVID in kids, but I have looked into a lot of the evidence base for um, uh, COVID in children, um, also about whether um, children can get it, whether they can spread it, who they spread it to, um, and, um, and then particularly about um, schools in, in preparation for this um, talk, looking at the, uh, um, the, the um, data from uh, places that have not closed down um, their schools and whether, than, whether or not they've had um, any transmission. Um, I, like you are probably now, was very anxious six weeks ago. Um, there was very little um, data sort of out there about transmission for COVID when people are infectious. Um, and so I took it um, upon myself with um, colleagues to um, really um, lead on the PPE aspects of, of um, COVID in Adam Brooks and We've had a number of success stories. For, for example, we've managed to procure lots of local manufacturing to make us face masks and um, face shields and things like that, um, and then stabilise the position um, because, as you're probably aware, we had a, a few teething problems with the uh, national stockpile, um, namely that the national stockpile didn't seem to stockpile much um, PPE um, or, or the PPE that we were requiring. Um, so I know a lot about how COVID is acquired, how it's passed on, uh, when it's passed on, and therefore um, how um, uh, teachers should therefore approach 
um, going back to school and how schools should um, uh, potentially reorganize the way um, that they work and um, the way that they um, sort of teach children and also things around sort of playtime and lunch times and things like that and hand hygiene. So hopefully you'll find this helpful. Um, I'll pass back to Simon and he can uh, direct what you want to get from me. That, yeah, that's great, Matt. I think the really helpful first to tell us about COVID and tell us about COVID-19 and, and what you know about it to uh, in, uh, improve our understanding of the virus itself. And then we can perhaps move on to how it's, how it's spread. Yeah. So um, of, um, uh, COVID is one of a number of coronaviruses. Um, there are eight in total, um, five of which um, cause things like the common cold. Um, and we all have probably got those and got immunity to them. They've been around um, for, lots of, um, for lots and lots of years. They slowly shift um, uh, their um, uh, genetic code so that we can get reinfected as they become slightly different and maybe slightly differently enter cells. Um, and then there are three um, which have come about in the last um, uh, sort of decade, which you've probably heard about. So um, the first one was SARS. So that was um, uh, a quite a devastating illness with um, around about a 60% uh, mortality rate um, and was transmitted from Southeast Asia to Canada quite um, disastrously. Um, however, because of the high fatality rate in the short incubation period, um, it was fairly easy to spot who had it. Um, the next um, one was MERS or um, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, um, which started in camels. Um, now that has been isolated mainly to um, Dubai, but obviously in um, patients that could present with fever and cough um, to a UK hospital that have traveled as tourists to, to um, areas such as the UAE and Dubai, we, we're very um, aware of that and they go into high isolation. Um, similar sort of mortality for MERS as to, um, to SARS. Um, and then we have SARS-CoV-2. So um, um, COVID is, is the name of the disease. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. So it's, it's another virus that causes SARS, which is severe acute respiratory syndrome. Um, unfortunately, SARS-CoV-2 is a completely um, a novel virus that we as the human population, human species, has never seen before. So um, the difficulty with that is that um, often people get infection um, and severe infection before the body sort of wakes up its immune response, particularly in adults, because in general, because we've seen lots of viruses before, our immune system to some degree sort of dampens down its responses to new viruses so that we don't have to mount such a high uh, fever and things. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 as the disease um, occurred was um, first experienced in Wuhan. We believe it started in a, a wet market in China, which is one way you have live wild animals and, um, and also food. Um, coronaviruses are um, uh, mainly initiated in bat species and then from their droppings acquired by lots of um, uh, wild animals, um, which then either have an illness or, um, or just carry a coronavirus. Now the difficulty with um, that sort of mode of transmission is that that then exposes the bat coronavirus um, to whatever was in the wild animal. Now we think it might have been a pangolin, but that's complete conjecture because they weren't actually able to find it in any of the pangolins in the wet market. But um, uh, but if it if it was, then a pangolin coronavirus potentially mixed with a bat coronavirus and caused something which was able to transmit into humans. Now that is a a billion to one or even trillion to one chance of it happening, but it's happening so frequently and viruses. Um, uh, uh, are obviously mutating all the time that unfortunately this has occurred. So um, it's not expected to happen that often. Um, uh, they talk about one in a hundred year event. Um, and unfortunately we are in a, a one in a hundred year um, event with SARS-CoV-2. Um, so just a little bit about um, coronaviruses. So um, they are only transmitted through mucous membranes. So that's the mouth and the eyes. Um, they are not transmitted and, and um, the respiratory um, tract. So you either have to um, have the virus particles on your eyes, um, either inhale them or um, have it on your hands and then put your hands in your mouth. Um, it isn't uh, acquired um, through any other route. Um, it's not a bloodborne virus. So um, you can't get a needle stick and transmit um, coronavirus. Um, what we know um, about the mutation is that it um, 
it's quite interesting in that um, it has a fairly protracted incubation period. So you get infected at day one or day, day naught, and then um, the mid range before the presentation of symptoms is between about five to seven days. Um, and unfortunately, um, the virus is infectious before that. So that makes it extremely difficult as a disease to control because you've probably heard in the last few days that there's going to be a contact tracing app um, starting on the Isle of Wight. Um, but that's all uh, down to um, uh, um, measuring uh, who's got symptoms and then therefore checking their contacts um, and getting them tested. Um, if you can spread the virus before you're symptomatic, um, uh, that is obviously problematic for that sort of model. Um, but what we do know is that in the asymptomatic phase, you are probably shedding less virus um, than uh, around about day two or day three of your symptoms when you're shedding the most virus. Um, and by day seven, um, most people, I emphasize most, most fit and healthy people, um, stop shedding the virus. And that's why um, the government guidance has always been um, if you um, have symptoms, then you isolate yourself for seven days because by seven days, you're probably excreting less virus and therefore you can't pass it on to um, someone else. And that also explains why your household has to then isolate for 14 days because if you're um, isolating for seven and, um, and at day one, you're, you still potentially could have passed it on to your family um, at day eight um, or day seven. Um, then they won't present symptoms till around day 10, day 12. Um, so 14 is sort of taken as a conservative um, estimate. Um, as to how people are present, um, it's actually, I mean, I know it's a, it's a horrid disease, but it's, it's actually been fascinating to observe as a, as a clinician because this disease, although you hear about fever and cough, um, it can present in a in a multitude of different ways. So I've seen meningitis, encephalitis, cough, fever, um, diarrhea, abdominal pain, intestinal obstruction, earache, sore throat, um, and then just a general sort of confusion sort of picture with maybe a mild fever and myalgia, like typical flu. Um, so that also then pr pr uh, poses a difficulty because it just looks like any other virus. Um, so how do you know whether you've got it? So there we come to testing. Um, and uh, you've probably heard a lot about testing and there's so 100,000 tests a day. Um, to put it bluntly, the tests, whatever we have are rubbish um, because unfortunately we can only test from the nose and the throat um, and COVID doesn't live in the nose and the throat to any great degree. Now we've known that from the early days in Wuhan because only 1% of patients ever got a runny nose with COVID. Um, and uh, around about 15% got a sore throat. Um, so we've definitely seen cases where um, patients have had um, a, um, a COVID illness. Um, uh, so certain were we that they had COVID that we put them next to other patients with COVID, but their tests came back negative. Um, so there are problems obviously with the testing strategy, um, but repeated testing is one way to get around that, that if you just sample from the same site multiple times, you might be able to get it. Now, now, hopefully soon we will be um, rolling out antibody testing um, to, uh, to a larger um, pool of people. Um, and um, the way New South Wales have managed um, COVID in schools particularly has been with antibody testing um, because we can do that with a finger prick. Um, children um, generally would allow you to, um, to do that. Um, and, um, and it allows you to, um, uh, to control outbreaks because it can tell you who has seen the virus and therefore um, where it has been um, in your population. So if so I... That, um, um, yep. that raises a question really then, is the contact and tracing going to be helpful for schools? And, and if somebody um, is tested negative but has been displaying some symptoms, one of our staff, should we still be asking to stay off for an extended period? So I think I think the biggest focus for schools is going to be teachers. So um, children we know um, can acquire the disease. They have exactly the same. If they're exposed to the disease, they will get it equally as um, as an adult would do. That's the so-called attack rate. So the attack rate in Wuhan was equal across all the age groups barring 85 plus where they seem to get it more. Um, so we know children can get it, but when they get it, they're more likely to be asymptomatic or, or get a very mild disease. Now that poses a problem because we don't actually then test them. 
So in, in all the data, we know that um, children and those up to 20 are, are greatly underrepresented in the um, testing. So testing per capita and also test positives per capita. Um, so, um, so knowing what actually is going on with children is, is to some degree a little bit of a, um, a grey area. But, but certainly when it comes to teachers, um, uh, using antibodies and swab testing is going to be the best way for A, telling them whether they've seen it, B, whether they potentially have seen it some time ago and therefore are likely to not be infectious, the so-called phase two period of an illness, um, and C, um, whether they swab positive and therefore are likely still to be infectious and should continue to, to be off work. So this antibody test is going to be the game changer for us? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it, it truly is seen as the, the holy grail for, for us as clinicians, particularly when you've got a, a bad, well, not a bad test, but a, um, a, a test which, which often is negative even when the disease is present. Um, the antibody is, um, is fairly good at telling you whether you've seen the illness. Unfortunately, it also tells people that haven't seen the illness um, that they might have seen it. So um, when you roll that over, you, you can't actually roll that over in a, into a population um, a screening program because um, you'll probably tell half the people that you test that test positive that they actually have had the disease. Now that's called the specificity and I can send you some slides on that in a bit detail. But, but the, if you have an outbreak in a school, obviously the prevalence is higher and therefore you're not so worried about um, telling people that they might have seen it when they haven't seen it because it's it's likely that they have seen it anyway. Um, okay, that's really helpful. And can you tell us a bit how it's spread and, and how it spreads across different um, different materials? That's, that was really helpful the other day. Yeah, so um, there are two main routes of transmission. So um, there is um, uh, it's spread by respiratory droplets. Um, so that's um, uh, spread when people talk, when people cough, when people sneeze, um, but I, um, and also just when they breathe. So, um, uh, so it's not just if, if a child or an adult is coughing that they can spread the disease. We know that um, talking, for example, the, the frequency at which the vocal cords vibrate actually does expel quite a, um, a large amount of virus, hence why the UK is probably going to go to face coverings to try and prevent that expiration of virus um, from them. So that's the, the, the number one route of how it leaves the body. Now, once it's left the body, um, the virus um, is, um, is a large virus and it's actually coated in a, a fatty um, membrane, which actually means that it survives in the environment for quite some time. Um, now, um, this is quite important in schools because you need to um, effectively um, treat surfaces that a child has either coughed on or um, had close contact with um, as being um, potentially um, contaminated. Um, now any surface um, that has is potentially a contaminant that can transmit infection is what we call a fomite. Um, so that's um, F-O-M-I-T-E. Um, it could also, they're, they're also in some circles called foamies, um, but, um, but we, we call them fomites. Um, like termites, um, but not like termites. Um, so, um, so fomites are um, uh, can be anything. So, glass window, um, pen, um, clothing, um, and it's the type of surface that the virus lands on that depends on how long the virus lives for. So, so I go to work um, not in this, um, but I wear scrubs, um, and we know that on clothing. Um, the virus um, lands, it dries out quicker because of the, 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 the fabric um, and the rough surface um, and therefore it, it can survive on that type of surface and be transmissible for about six hours. Um, uh, however, if the surface is completely smooth um, and if you imagine a respiratory droplet goes on there and sits on there, it's not going to disperse and then it will gradually shrink away um, over time um, and these are micron uh, um, sort of in diameter um, particles. Um, and we know that um, on glass and things like stainless steel, um, it is um, likely that the virus is, um, is present and transmissible for up to six days. So without a vaccine and without drugs, um, the main uh, way that we can tr control this virus is A, isolating infected people and B, cleaning. So actually on my ward, um, the most important person is, is not me assessing the person with COVID, it's the cleaner. 
um, who is having to decontaminate the rooms in between each patient because then we can be confident that when we go in there, if I touch the light switch, if I touch this and that and the other, then um, it's going to be clean. Um, I'm obviously, when I go in, I'm wearing um, PPE, um, gloves, apron, um, uh, face shield and face mask. Um, but um, obviously in schools um, where the prevalence is going to be lower um, and um, the transmission therefore is going to be less likely, um, you're not going to be needed to wear that degree of PPE, but you are going to need to be aware that obviously in an unprotected state, if you touch something and it's on your hands, then you need to treat effectively any touching of a surface that a child may have touched or breathed on or coughed on um, is a potential uh, fomite and therefore you need um, specific um, hand hygiene. Um, do you want me to talk a bit about if so how this might change um, how teachers approach children and what we were talking about before about um, sort of heights and things like that? Yeah, so, so it can't go through the skin um, but if you do if you are touching surfaces that's why we have to have these really good uh, hygiene um, hygiene routines as well but yeah let's, let's go and talk about that Matt that'll be good. Yeah, so um, so with a respiratory droplet, um, so if you imagine uh, sort of um, physics lessons, you've got your cannon, you fire your cannonball, and the cannon, depending on the direction of the cannon, will sort of expel, but then it gradually sort of arcs down into the air. So obviously, if this is your child who's going to sneeze at you, you don't want your head here. Um, so um, ideally, I know I do still, um, uh, with my patients get down to their eye level but I'm wearing a, a full um, face shield and face mask so in the absence of that um, your best protection is distancing um, so um, uh, where possible maintaining um, the um, Dutch are going back to school I think on the 11th of uh, May and I think they've said 1.5 meters we say two meters um, Whereas actually, I mean, it's an exponential decay as far as you get away from the source. So obviously, if someone sneezes in your face, um, it's going to be a high likelihood. If you go to half a meter, it maybe is reduced by 10 times, 10 fold, 100 fold, 1000 fold. So uh, 1.5 to 2 meters seems about reasonable. Um, and, um, and that's direct sort of, um, uh, so that's the distance not between sort of bodies, that's the distance between mucous membranes or transmission points. So obviously if you stood up and were say a meter away, um, the actual total distance uh, might be 1.52 meters. Um, but it, it would be key to not be below um, a child if they're talking to you, um, because if, if they're talking, they're potentially asymptomatically spreading um, and therefore could give it to you and it's actually although we know that so there have been no deaths uh, worldwide um, in under nines um, uh, which is key for you as primary school teachers um, uh, we do know that they can get it and that that also the there is still the same uh, concentration of virus if they were to have it in their nose and throat as as adults so there's no reason to suspect that they couldn't infect a teacher um, uh, so I think, um, and because teachers are by nature older um, and potentially with other conditions, it's, it's teacher protection um, that you need to see as vital, less so children protection. Although what, in order to protect teachers, um, you want to adopt measures uh, whereby you're going to transmit less virus between pupils because if you get more virus in your classroom then that obviously increases the, uh, the, the the likelihood for transmission so if you've got one kid that's asymptomatic that might be spreading it um, that's just talking that the concentration of virus in the environment is actually too low for you to probably get infected what we know about sort of influenza and other coronaviruses is that you sort of need about three or four um, in, a, in a reasonably close space uh, without Good enough ventilation and then that can be enough that a, someone coming in externally without infection could then get infected. Matt so kind of one thing that going, just going back to surfaces what about paper because we have books that go home we have we mark we mark children's books what, what about paper and what about books going home what about marking children's work? So um, certainly the, the, the surface of the book if it's um, uh, uh, sort of a card with um, a, a, a little bit of a sheen. Paper is probably akin to clothing. So um, it's a very sort of conservative 
estimate you would you would want to because obviously you can't clean paper um, you would want to have paper um, in a sort of holding state for the virus to desiccate and not be transmitted for around about 12 hours if that fitted um, obviously the the longer if you went up to 24 hours that would be uh, that would be ideal if your books are um, it's important to note if your books are laminated as most books um, in libraries are to, to increase their durability that would be the six day um, uh, six day mark and then I suppose it's, it's just important to make clear that this virus if exposed to any form of detergent because I mentioned it's coated with a lipid layer um, because you're going to be dealing with virus at particularly low concentration it's not like you're in a hospital where there's millions of copies of virus circulating and, and we have to use high viral um, uh, viruside um, cleaners effectively if you've not got that much and you're wiping it um, you can you can use simple detergents like fairy liquid um, so just a, 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 a solution of that um, and it would be good practice if you were doing that um, uh, to do it at both stages so so potentially the teacher could be asymptomatically spreading it because um, obviously they wouldn't be marking work if they had symptoms um, they could then contaminate all the books, send it out to all the kids. Um, and then uh, if the kids then or the parents then don't wipe the books down or it hasn't been left for so long, then they could get it and bring it back into schools. So it's breaking these transmission chains that's important. Um, these things are, are very difficult to study because to, to study it, you would have to purposefully infect people and you can't purposefully infect people with COVID. Um, so so um, we are probably being overly cautious, but we know that in a household, so say if dad comes home and has COVID, um, the R number within the household is 0.4. Now the R number as a total with COVID is between about two and four. So so if you want so the r number is how many people you infect um for every person that's infected so so if it's 0.4 for dad when he comes home to see his family that means that there's a 50 50 chance that one of those family members will get infected but dad has already infected potentially three others in a in a non-lockdown scenario so that's with all his other contacts and it can only be assumed that some of those contacts will have got it from contaminated surfaces that dad has put the virus onto. Um, so the key thing which we've learned in hospitals is really focusing on contact points. So things that are always touched, things like taps, light switches, pens, pencils, um, uh, backs of chairs, um, door handles, things like that. You just got to taps and then Sorry? you got to taps and then you got to taps and then you broke up a Okay, bit. so taps, um, light switches, um, door handles, um, pens, um, th uh, anything effectively that is high use, scissors, um, and you um, will want to be satisfied that you have a regime in place that those sorts of things can be decontaminated or that they're not going to be shared. So one way of, around all of this is um, when it comes to say uh, school equipment um, that each child has their own equipment effectively I don't know how feasible that is but um, but if you didn't have enough scissors to do that then only doing scissor activities within with children so that they could have enough and then you would decontaminate them between um, between uses um, and decontamination would would be similar just soapy liquid uh, fairy liquid and water um, and um, and then just trying them Man, that so, seems quite quite practical for our older children who sit at desks. Um, it may have a, a, a set of equipment, but our very youngest children are touching lots of things. They're very tactile. They're using blocks. They're using small play. Um, is yeah. what we do of our very youngest children who who have a, a play based curriculum? Yeah. So I think reassuringly, um, children the younger they get, um, it's very likely that they acquire the disease less readily. So the general quoted figure is that it, they're about a third as likely um, to get the disease as um, the, their teacher. So, um, and that's quite key because you actually don't need to reduce transmission by that much for it to not then 
be a problem in spreading. So because the very youngest people don't seem to acquire it as well, they equally won't then get infected and therefore spread it as well. So, so the measures which you need to do, and hence why primary schools and nurseries are probably going to open first, because their children that are going there are less likely to acquire the disease in the first place. And in fact, the only case in New South Wales of acquisition of a child from a primary school teacher was actually where the teacher was infected and then gave it to the child. There's been no evidence, no, no sort of um, examples whereby the children have sort of passed it up. Um, or that even if they do pass it between themselves, that they get severe disease. So there is there are no cases of, um, uh, um, uh, as I've said, fatalities. Um, there are cases of very young children requiring um, uh, critical care, um, but they usually have underlying problems. Um, there are exceptions to that, but in a, when you're talking about a pandemic affecting millions of people, you're bound to get the one or two. But I th the general take home message is that your kids are generally going to be are, are very, are very well protected from A, getting it, and therefore if they don't get it, they're not going to spread it. And if they do get it and spread it and give it to another kid, that kid is there therefore less likely to catch it, but also less likely if they do catch it to get severe disease. Okay, so tell me about um, a lot of schools have been putting masking tape on the floor and seeing how many children they can fit in a classroom. Um, I think about 10 uh, to 12 in a, third, in a 60 uh, square meter classroom. What, what are your thoughts on that sort of social distancing that we've been recommended for adults being implemented in schools? So I think um, as much as possible, the older the children get, um, the more important it would be because the older they get, so beyond um, sort of five, six, um, the older they get, the more important it is to try and as much as possible when they are doing work in an indoor space that doesn't have such good ventilation um, to maintain spacing out. Now that's because if, if, if say you do have the three children that are infected, um, asymptomatically spreading it, the chances of them coming into a close proximity such that the area and the air around them is full of virus particles enough for say a teacher to get infected is less. Obviously the younger you are, so the reception kids, firstly because they're less likely to get it and less likely then therefore to spread it, means that social distancing is a probably not practical but b less vital. Um, however, it probably would still be sensible to try and reduce mixing between, firstly between classes, but also mixing between year groups. Um, because if an older child has it, or say three older child children have it, and it's in their classroom, um, and then they then mix with other classrooms, potentially you've then got five classrooms with a problem as opposed to one classroom with a problem. So I think the general, the, the general idea of putting children when they are indoors spaced out is a good one. I wouldn't get so fussed about um, making sure that everyone is sort of, um, I mean, I was in B&Q the other day and it was like Pac-Man, you're, you're going down a, a corridor and then as soon as you see someone approaching you, turn around and walk the other way. <laughs> um, great passing, imagine. obviously, yeah, passing is, is, I mean, you will come into close contact with people but but what we're talking about here is two people close together for a reasonable amount of time about 15 minutes um and then potentially talking to each other and then potentially acquiring it if it's bleating so if it's someone passing each other that that's that's particularly with younger children is not going to affect transmission in any great way shape or form um, if you've got a kid that's got a really barking cough and a fever, obviously that that changes things because they are at that point at the peak of their infectivity. Um, but but going back to the asymptomatic um, uh, um, uh, uh, carriers, there isn't there is a feeling that because um, they are obviously less that they're not coughing so much that they probably are less infectious. Um, although that isn't that isn't proven as yet. 
Excellent. Okay, just um, I'll just before we go on to PPE, because I know you're you're an expert in that. But can you just uh, talk about uh, cleaning? You talked about soap and water um, detergent being quite um, being good. But um, in terms of our, our cleaners working in schools, what's the gold standard in terms of uh, our cleaning materials if we can get hold of them? Yeah. So um, uh, anything that dissolves a, a lipid. So um, so so the the ones that we use in hospitals are a combination of um, detergents um, and then um, uh, antioxidant sort of uh, um, uh, uh, materials um, which then use sort of free radicals to break down particles but also um, alcohol based um, cleaners um, so the free radicals would be things like bleach um, so hydrogen peroxide um, or um, alcohol um, but you have to get up to a fair high concentration of alcohol for it to be um, effective such that you probably will find that you you won't get be able to get a hold of the stock because I think the the, um, uh, the government's diverted all production uh, to higher risk areas um, uh, general um, cleaners that you buy will have those things in them so um, uh, particularly things like um, Dettol they have um, uh, and they're sort of proven antibacterial antiviral um, agents within them but I think the the key thing to stress is that you don't have to uh, put something, you don't have to apply something that will kill the virus. What I would see that schools need to do is to remove the virus into something like um, a cloth and then wash it down the sink. Um, the reason we have to use those types of cleaners is because we're having to put it onto things that we can't then get rid of. We can't wash away like ECG machines or the clothing that we're wearing or the, the visors that we're wearing i have to take my visor off to go and eat and then i have to put it back on so therefore i have to have something that will kill the virus actually on it um for various reasons i can't wash it under the tap because of the the, the fixings um but if you if you had a, a solution of soapy water and you wiped the virus off the surface and then wiped it that washed it down the sink that virus is gone you don't need to warm necessarily focus water, so man. much it's yeah warm cold soapy water we need. Um, warm would um, would be um, better just because yeah. um, we know that the, the mm -hmm. we know that warm things with detergent it breaks down yeah. fat yeah. better. Yeah. That's really helpful. Okay, so we're going to go on to PPE now. If that's okay, I know you're you're an expert in PPE and you've been giving it a lot of thought. When we had a chat on Tuesday, we talked about uh, changing nappies. We talked about children that might spit because um, because of behaviour issues. But there's also um, people administering first aid. And also cleaners as well. If I, you're saying that your cleaners are the most important members of staff in your hospital, um, what's, the, mm -hmm. uh, what's the guidance you'd like to go and give to keep our cleaners safe um, when they're yeah. in the school? Yeah, so, um, so when you so to take um, each of those in turn, so nappy changing, um, we know that um, uh, stool transmission um, is, is, is quite high with this um, virus. Um, so um, the, the, the longest we've detected virus um, is up to 30 days and that's been from patient stool. Um, now coming back to the fact that kids can get it, um, kids have equally the, the same, if, if they're exposed they have e the equal attack rate so um, and when they have had it and we've tested them we know that the virus is in their nose um, in a, as much concentration so I, I think it's inconceivable that it wouldn't be in stool in the same concentration. The difficulty is that we, we can't be certain about that because we haven't had enough children to do the, do the studies. Um, but, but if children expel virus in stool as much as adults, I think it's vital, therefore, um, that um, firstly, you maybe approach nappy changing in a, in a, in a different way in that, um, uh, you're not facing um, you're sort of doing it from a side on um, sort of view which I learned very quickly as a dad um, to do um, that you you want to be out of the line of fire um, because like um, if someone coughed and they're coughing and your face is here um, if you're changing someone's nappy you don't want to be here you want to be round at the side um, now it would be interesting to to know I think because obviously those that are having nappies changed, as I said, the younger that you get, 
the less likely it is that you acquire the disease and therefore the less likely it is that you will transmit the disease. Therefore, um, you probably, with simple measures like that and ensuring things like ventilation, so where you're changing the nappy, you've got good airflow. Um, because we do know in, in Wuhan when they've tested um, where the virus is in highest concentration, it is in non-ventilated toilets. It's not next to the ventilated patient in ITU. It's in a one meter by one meter cube toilet with no ventilation. Um, so, um, so, so that I, what I would say and what I would suggest is if you are unlikely, if you, if you are able to do other measures, so making sure that you're um, doing the nappy um, at the side, perhaps more towards the head end going down rather than the sort of the bottom end looking up. Um, uh, but also being very clear about wiping away from you um, and then really, 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 really good hand hygiene afterwards. Um, and then really, really, really good decontamination in between. Um, I don't think you would then need to wear, think about wearing um, uh, um, sort of uh, visors or face shields. It may be that you can set up something whereby there is a little bit of a screen type apparatus between you and the, um, the, 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 the child um, such that if, if there was an explosion then, um, then it would be uh, to a large degree contained. Um, spitters are a difficult one um, so I would have suggested that if you've got spitters and potentially it's going into your face anyway from what we know about influenza and all the other viruses that eye protection should probably be worn in those circumstances anyway and just simple sort of chemistry safety specs would be sufficient all you're trying to do is just to if they spit at you and say they have asymptomatic spread which we already know is quite unlikely because they're less likely to get it but if they do have it that it's not going to go straight into your eye great that's really helpful and now i mentioned the cleaners our cleaning staff do they need to oh yeah cleaning stuff so um when it's on a surface um, if you apply a liquid to it, it doesn't then get dispersed um, into the air. So, so the key thing about um, cleaners is that they don't use sort of buffing cloths. Um, so when they're um, cleaning floors, for example, um, uh, they would spray uh, from what I've seen the floor and then they would use a, uh, if they do use a buffer machine. Um, but effectively, before you do any cleaning, you want to make the surface wet. So that when, if the virus is on there, it's then caught by something that then comes along and dries it, and then that goes down the sink. What you don't want to do is potentially there's respiratory droplets that have landed on a surface. They become a bit like a little powder, and then when you wipe them with a cloth, they go all the way up. Um, so um, standard hoovers filter out if, with HEPA filters and things they hoover out uh, it from carpets but spread but but survival on carpets would be very minimal um, mm -hmm. uh, it would you would be big particularly because of the um, the pile of the carpet it's very unlikely that you would you would disturb you would um, sort of spread um, the virus from that but but smooth surfaces smooth floors so clean with liquid the before you EPA, yeah would you recommend? so um, so I think um, because because they are obviously coming in, what I would say is after the school have left, what we do with patients that are infected is leave half an hour before the cleaner goes in. Mm -hmm. So um, after all the children have left and all the teachers have left, because actually it's probably the, the teachers that, are very, uh, that, that potentially could be also asymptomatically spreading it, um, uh, then um, leave it a little while before the cleaner comes in, then they don't have to wear anything specifically so long as they adopt those um, clean practices. Obviously gloves um, you would want to wear because if they, if they wash it down the sink but they are not so used to the hand washing uh, technique, um, then there could be some on their wrist, they might scratch their wrist and then they might touch their face. So, um, so I think if, there, if there's any bit of them that's gonna get um, potentially contaminated, then, then definitely wearing sort of reasonably long, long gloves. Um, to clean the place, but they are vital to you because you want to try and decontaminate the area as regularly and as frequently as possible because this virus is going to be with us for a, for a good length of time, probably 18 months. It depends on how long we're immune for. So embedding practice as soon as schools reopen is key to 
getting to the end game, which is hopefully a vaccine. Excellent. That's uh, that, that, that's really helpful. Again, Matt, thank you so much. And um, finally, on PP, what about masks? What do you think about children wearing masks? Teachers wearing masks? What are your thoughts on uh, on that? So um, it we it it. it it's a very tricky um, uh, area to sort of investigate and to look at. But what we know is that in societies such as Southeast Asian uh, countries, whereby face masks are the routine, um, they have fared much, much better um, in this um, pandemic. Now, um, the face masks that were, um, so I would, so I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of definition. So face masks are protective for the wearer face coverings are protective for everyone else. So I think what we're talking about here is face coverings because we can't even get enough masks for hospital staff. Um, so I don't think there's going to be enough face masks for um, wider sort of use. But face coverings are interesting because if you are asymptomatically spreading it um, and talking, um, if you've got a face covering on, that will re definitely reduce the transmission. Me, I, I said, I said to you when we first met. Um, I have a view, and my wife, who's a GP, has a different view about whether or not children should be wearing face coverings. My view is that because this virus is going to be with us for some time, actually, schools could lead in the societal change that is required to get control of this, in that they can then teach why face coverings are important as a sort of altruistic protecting others measure because I don't know whether I've got it now actually I do because I was swabbed yesterday but um, I don't know I, you don't know whether you've got it asymptomatically and therefore can infect other people and therefore choosing to wear a face mask is a positive thing for society now that you're your leaders in education you know how much that is workable and how that might be um, uh, obviously um, seen by parents um, and wider society but I certainly think face coverings are going to become a feature of national life for the foreseeable future till we have a vaccine so certainly um, other countries in Europe have mandated um, face coverings for public transport um, what we decide to do on schools I don't think um, Holland no not Holland where is it Oh, it's Holland. I think it's Holland going back on the, um, uh, um, the, the um, uh, going back on the 11th of May. I don't think they're mandating face coverings in schools. Um, I'm not so sure on what New South Wales did, um, um, but I've sent um, Dan some uh, data on transmission in schools from New South Wales. Um, I think face coverings in public transport make sense because you've got lots of vulnerable people, older people, um, adults that are then uh, highly likely to to be severely unwell if they get it um, and also more likely to acquire it if someone sitting next to them has it in schools because as I've said children are less likely to get it and they're therefore less likely to spread it whether or not face coverings would be meaningful is um, is um, doubtful if it is advised I suspect it's not going to be advised for primary schools. Um, but um, if a child, if it, if it turns out that children can transmit this disease, um, then face coverings may, may um, come in. It may be something that you opt to do as a trial, as a pilot, um, to just to see, and I think that would be helpful, just what the response is. So, um, so um, rather than saying this is national guidance, we're going to just follow national guidance. Um, you could say, actually, let's maybe see what the approach, what face coverings. Um, uh, you, it won't obviously show you about transmission because transmission rates will be very low. But but you could look at it from an education standpoint and parental acceptance standpoint and just see if we had to get to this stage collect the data from a UK perspective as to how it would be seen um, because um, part of the government's reluctance to instigate all of this is that it's just countercultural, um, mm. and um, I'll leave that to you to decide whether or not mm. that will be something that you'd want. I, I certainly think preparation is key um, and I wouldn't rely having been 
sort of reliant on national bodies to come up with guidance. I wouldn't rely so heavily on national guidance. I think you as leaders um, need to think about um, what you think would be um, best um, uh, for your um, for your pupils um, and um, for your um, schools. It wouldn't protect staff, so it'd just be a, a way of the staff stopping the spread uh, to the children. So it would, yeah, it would protect staff in that they wouldn't. Um, if someone was, if a kid had it asymptomatically, you wouldn't spread it. Mm. Um, but also, if the teacher was wearing one, the only case, as I said, of transmission within primary schools was was from a teacher to a pupil. Um, and if the teacher was wearing a face covering, then that might not have occurred. But obviously, yeah. We, we, yeah. And there's also a balance there, Matt, because you've also got children with um, hearing difficulties and being able to communicate. So it's, it's exactly it will make sense of. Matt, I think we've covered most of the things we covered um, on, on Tuesday now. Is there anything you think we've missed? Because I'd like to open the floor to Ray to go and start uh, distilling some of the yeah. questions. Can uh, I can I just say some? Um, so um, the the small print of the text, uh, the small print of, of of what I've been saying. So the caveats. So the, um, this disease started in older people. Um, it started in, in a wet market with a lots of older people that got very sick and then spread it to lots of doctors who are younger people who then spread it between their year groups. Now, what we know is that you as a teacher are much more likely to spread it to another teacher than to a pupil. Um, and when we look at transmission pairs, they are very... Um, uh, uh, they're clustered around uh, a linear sort of line. So if I'm 40, I'm much more likely to infect someone that's 40. There is a bit of a range there, but just by the nature of the people that I come into contact with, that's who I spread it to. So if you imagine it started in, in the elderly, it moved to the younger people, and then they took it back home, and that's how children got infected. So children have been the end of the, um, the transmission chains, and Unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, I think it was a good idea. Schools were locked down and households were locked in at the very start. So because children actually acquired the illness during lockdown, we have very little data on their own infectivity. So a lot of what I've been saying to you about children, perhaps a third less likely to get infected, is based on current evidence of COVID. And that's because they just haven't been in the circles of which this virus has been um, uh, has been in the open population to uh, to experience um, uh, what it would do in that in that sort of population. So, so we are in a very much a grey area as to um, how when schools go back, that is going to manifest itself. Because potentially now that kids have infection and they're mild and asymptomatic, potentially that could set up the reverse. So you could, the, the kids could then spread it to uh, teachers or parents, parents could spread it to, so I think there's a lot to be said as well about when older people come into the school that you then firstly keep older people separate from each other, but you also keep children separate from other older people. So you try and as much as possible, as we have been doing in our households, keep everyone in their so-called bubble. So it doesn't matter if I cuddle or kiss my kid, but obviously I wouldn't want to go back to the way it was where I was cuddling, kissing my godkids who also um, go to Milton Road. I'd probably want to still maintain some of that distancing. Really helpful, excellent. Okay, Ray. Ray, it's, um, it's just about five time. I'm going to give 10 minutes for Q&A, Ray, because um, we, we've taken a lot of Matt's time. I said we'd only have an hour. So Matt, are you okay to go over by five yeah, minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so a question straight in then about temperature checking children as they come in in the morning. Any thoughts on that, Matthew? Um, I think it would be um, good if it's positive. Unfortunately, um, children seem to not have temperatures um, with this disease, so I don't think it would be very helpful. Similar to adults, only most people would get a temperature, but by the time you get a temperature, the illness is petering out so I think it would be it, it, it wouldn't be um, and you'd probably pick up other illnesses that you wouldn't necessarily isolate um, someone for um, if you had the facility I don't think there's I mean there might be a negative con connotation because parents have planned to go to work and then you temperature check them and then that scraps all the plans um, temperature checking at home is probably a, a better idea. So asking pa parents to temperature check their children 
because if they do have a temperature they are likely to be infectious um, and as we are in a pandemic and it's not the winter it's probable that it could be covid um, and therefore that would put that would be a better option i think matt i also heard of a, a school that's thinking of getting one of these uv ones that people are selling to schools it sounded it didn't sound right to me what do you think is that the one where they uh, it's a camera and it will tell um, whether you have a temperature like air no, you think... need to scan over surfaces to, to, um, to, to oh no 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 it's no, no. a bit trumptillion to me yes so uh, thank you for that I mean uh, you, yeah you have to expose it to about five minutes of UV light mm -hmm. for it to um, desiccate so I mean if you, you'd spend the whole uh, no 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 kiddies kiddies need to go okay my daughter's joined us so um. Great. okay <laughs> yeah right can you can you go Juliet sweet please do you want to say hello just stay there then <laughs> uh, so next question it's one that we've talked about before Matt uh, about gloves whether whether staff should wear gloves routinely uh, or not yes yeah, so I think um, gloves are um, give you a false sense of reassurance and also because the virus lives uh, less on skin um, than it does um, on uh, um, uh, so it, it lives for less time on skin because of the rough nature of the skin than gloves um, also, it's actually quite difficult to put to remove gloves without contaminating yourself. And so you might get into a situation where you do lots of work, potentially get your gloves contaminated, take off your gloves, you've got a false sense of security that your hands are clean, and therefore you don't clean your hands, um, or you don't clean your wrists, which is where we know most people don't clean anyway. Um, so I think um, uh, no, uh, no to gloves. Um, but definitely yes to um, good hand hygiene. So remember, it doesn't go through skin. It, even if you've got a cut, it doesn't go through a cut. So your skin is your glove um, and you just need to keep cleaning your glove. So another question on cleaning. Um, in view of early years classrooms where there is a lot of resources that are being continually touched, would you be advocating for ongoing cleaning? Hi, Hugh. Um, or would you be talking- <laughs> He can't hear you, but- uh, or just cleaning at the end of the day? I think generally, um, I mean, it depends on what's workable. Um, so in a low prevalence area, um, you probably only have to clean it, um, uh, say, once a day. Um, so it's not like I have, when, when I'm in hospital, I have a positive patient, we know they're positive, then you have to clean that area. And, and it's highly likely even if, it, if you've got someone else that they might have it, so we clean after each patient. Um, because they're less likely to have it, they're less likely to transmit it. If you're maintaining social distancing, I think just at the end of the day. Obviously, contact points are something different. So contact points are continually being touched and therefore are much more likely to get contaminated in a quicker time. So you probably want to um, have a regular cleaning said schedule. Um, and I would ad ad actually advise that you get the children involved in this because it would be really important to teach them about how diseases are acquired. Um, and so um, wiping down door handles, um, you could have like a, um, a, a two kids in the day that, that every now and then just get up and wipe the door handles, the light switches, things like that, things that they would be touching. Great. Um, so another, just an observation from somebody with regard to the nature of how it's transferred, uh, the idea of teachers getting into the habit of perhaps standing behind children rather than directly in front of them. Any views or thoughts on that? Yeah, that would, that would definitely, um, because obviously if, if the child talked and expelled away, um, then, then that would um, go away from you. Um, what would probably happen is um, you're behind them, the kid uh, looks up at you and, um, and um, surreptitiously sneezes. <laughs> um, and, um, but, but I think the general thing is put yourself in a position whereby you can maintain distancing. So, so not to sort of get trapped between lots of children that could then um, uh, um, uh, potentially uh, give it to you. So I think just generally, behind away from the mouth um above is is a good is a good um, practice um, and like i said um what i've learned and what my staff have learned to do is just to walk around with your hands together because you we all touch things all the time and we don't need to touch things um so just hands like walking around like this so then you don't touch the back of the kids chair you don't touch the table um because you don't need to you just um you're, you're holding your hands in front just in a clasped sort of way like that and then that potentially stops you 
it also stops you touching your face, um, which we know we do thousands of times a day. I can see quite a lot of you just touched your face. We want to do the minute silence, everybody, because we, we can, we, yeah, I think it'd be respectful to the minute silence at uh, 11 o'clock. So if you want to turn, um, I'll turn myself to mute and uh, just have a moment of reflection, thinking about uh, uh, um, future, uh, future loved ones and thinking about the past as well, because uh, we're, we seem very appropriate that we're um, so, uh, commemorating 75 years in this current situation. Okay, everybody, if Matt, you could unmute yourself and we'll just carry on raise questions. Four more minutes, Ray, and then we'll bring thanks. I can see uh, um, uh, Daddy's uh, once is in demand in uh, Matt's house. So uh, let's do four more minutes and then we'll draw it to a close for today. Uh, so just to go back to something you talked about earlier, Matt, about uh, classroom bubbles. Um, certainly at school, we found this a very useful idea. And then thinking about uh, individual equipment for the classroom to uh, reduce sharing of things. Uh, reducing the use of cloakrooms, so children using the backs of chairs to put their resources and really that sense of whatever you can do to reduce children coming closely into contact with each other. But can you tell us a little bit more about the, the bubble idea? Yeah, so, um, so obviously as, as we come out of lockdown, um, one way of controlling um, is to um, maintain people within a bubble. The theory being that if you keep seeing the same people within the bubble, um, that even if one person's infected, it then keeps it within that bubble. And the chances are that there aren't anyone infected in your bubble. And therefore, if you keep seeing the same people, you'll all be fine. Um, the problem, um, obviously, as you come out of lockdown is that um, in places like schools, although you can try and, if you, I, I would advise that you see the bubble as the class, um, because um, you're going to be, um, they're going to all be um, sitting around each other. And then if, if one of them does get infected, it, it, it's confined to that class and it burns itself out. Um, what you then want to do, if that class is infected, that it doesn't infect the next class, which is a separate sort of bubble. So you do that in one of two ways. So um, how they're doing it um, in other European countries is um, uh, um, maximising the classroom size. So um, using two classrooms for one class. Um, uh, and I think you can do that at Milton Road. You probably, you probably have to think about whether you can do it at, um, in other um, uh, settings um, and then seeing those classes on alternate days. So on one week, it would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then the next week, it would be Tuesday, Thursday, um, and then the remainder being uh, distance learning. Um, now, that means that you um, say in a, a year group like we have at Milton Road, where you have two classes in one year group, um, that, that if one class is infected, then the other class, because obviously you've decontaminated the, the, the classroom at the end of the day, that new class comes in, they have their own bubble, they're not going to then acquire the infection from the previous one. Similarly, if you're doing that, but then you have another year group that's sharing a playground, um, you want to then try and keep those bubbles separate as well. So having different play times and then different play times will mean different lunch times. So I, I don't know how feasible it would be to extend the lunch hour, but it'd be quite sensible to um, either have lunches provided um, in the classroom. So they go and collect their lunch and then bring it back and eat it in the classroom. But, uh, and then another class come in um, to collect their lunch and they take it back to their classroom. What you want to try and avoid is mixing of sort of classroom um, uh, bubbles. And then obviously at the end of, or at the start of the day, at the end of the day, there's gonna need to be some staggering um, because you don't want lots of mums and dads arriving all at the same time. There won't be any social distancing, all the kids will be sort of mingling. So you probably want to have it that um, if you've got 
a different year um, that they they come slightly different times. Um, so it probably will mean um, a earlier um, uh, earlier pickup um, for some people on one day, and then an earlier pickup for the next group on another day. So that by sort of um, the time all those kids have gone the new parents can start to arrive and pick up their kids. So mm. I think generally um, sort of restricting. Okay, I'm going to draw it to a close, mixing. Matt, because you've been absolutely amazing. I think you've got 120 school leaders who just think you are an absolute legend. Um, it gets bandied around far too much in my uh, um, on my Twitter timeline, but you truly are. Um, you've given your time today freely. I really appreciate it. We'd love to continue this relationship with you, Matt, because you've been just, you've helped, you know, you've actually, when I spoke to you on Tuesday, you made me feel so much calmer as a school leader that I could take steps to reduce the risk for my school community. So I'd mm -hmm. love to keep this relationship going because you're an absolutely um, a phenomenal wealth of knowledge and the more we're informed the better we can help um, help each other to make sure we, we come through this safely so uh, I, I really appreciate yeah. it. you've been nice. Dan, I'm not just say that on. So, Go on. yeah I was just going to say just um so um going forward I think um obviously you know uh, me on Twitter I'm very um keen to get some materials um uh, um, together including sort of um, instructional videos um, and various things about how to maybe set things up so I have obviously you're aware I have my own uh, website to do that we uh, we potentially can do something around that and um, and please do if, if people want to ask me questions I think Twitter probably would be the easiest um, way to you may get inundated uh, I just warn you there that's Twitter. fine that's uh, fine. It's, it's pretty That's intense, fine. so uh, I, I do want to. I know Paul, not sure Paul's still online now, but Paul White and the general secretary of the NHT is really yeah. keen you know, for you to do some work. I think the key thing Biden. about Twitter is, um, is though that it, if someone asks you a question, about 100 other people would have rather, would have liked to have asked you that question, and then at least yeah. it, if it's helpful, it gets. It and that's why, and that's why we do the webinars. And, and actually, uh, we did yeah. a webinar with the NHT with three and a half thousand school leaders last night. So we have, you know, we have a way of getting this amazing message out that you, you're giving to uh, 120 people today. So uh, really appreciate your time. Let, let's stay in touch. Let's carry on working together. And let's uh, be a working partnership with our wonderful yeah. colleague at the NHS. Ray? Um, yeah, sorry, quick question. Uh, what is your... You're finished, Ray. Yep. Is it, uh, do you want to finish at five past good? Because I think Matt's been really generous with his time. And I, think oh, no, it's all right. uh, just one more. That's fine. One more then. One more, Ray, because you're his head teacher and his children. Yeah, I mean, I'm the head teacher. So, uh, what is your, <laughs> can, so people are keen to know your Twitter handle. Oh, I don't, what is it? Out, um, out, <laughs> out, out. Me and Ray will tweet it out. Okay. I think, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's MJB302. But yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll tweet it out, Matt. Uh, we'll, we'll do that today as soon as we're off this line. Fabulous. Okay, everybody, right. stay safe. Have a great bank holiday weekend. As Thank you, Matt. Okay, take Thank care. No problem. Bye bye. Bye. See you next week. Bye. Bye.